So with that, uh, I would like you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. I gave some consideration to, uh, to where we should be going um, next. Well, not should we be jumping back to Acts, but I thought that since last week uh, we took a look at marriage, talked about being able to forgive and forbear in marriage, that I would continue to speak on marriage this week and in the next couple times that I preach. And to do so, um, returning to some things that we learned when we went through the book of Ephesians, and um, we were in these texts about over three years ago. And so I'd like to go back there again and remind ourselves of some of the things that we learned um, that will help us in marriage to, to do which, that which is the purpose, to glorify God. So with that being said, why don't we pray and we'll ask God to bless our time. Our Heavenly Father, we understand that, that your book is spiritual. It was inspired by the work of your spirit, caused, breathed out by you. And for us to be able to rightly understand it, we need the Spirit. We need you working inside of us, not just so that we'd understand what, what we are being told, what you are saying to us, but we need the work of your Spirit upon our hearts so that we would desire to carry it out, that we would desire to live it and walk by faith, even if it's difficult. And so we, we pray that, that you're working in us and that we are submitting to you, first and foremost, and that the roles that we play in marriage as husband and wife, uh, that how we carry out those roles, they're just an extension of our walk with you. It's just applying our, our Christianity to a specific dimension, a very important dimension of our life. And if we'll do that, not only will we be happy, and will we enjoy the fruits of, that are for us in, me, in marriage, but you will be glorified, and the world will see a picture of Christ's love for the church. So would you please give us ears to hear and hearts that desire to obey? And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Do you remember, um, think back to when you were living in your parents' home. Some of you are still living in your parents' home. All, all around, more than likely, on the walls are pictures that you have seen for years and years and years. They're just there. Some of them are photographs. Some of them might be artwork, and you have no idea where it came from, or it's just been hanging in that place on the wall ever since. How many times did you walk past those pictures and never really wondered anything about them? Imagine visiting your parents' after you, let's say, you've moved out and, and you bring a, a friend with you. And he greets your parents and then he can't help but notice that, that he's drawn to this one particular picture in the living room. One that's just, oh yeah, that thing, that's, I don't even know where my parents got it. It's just been hanging there ever since I was a kid. He asks you questions about it, but you, you really don't know anything about the picture. So you call over your mother, and, and she explains that it was given to them as a housewarming gift when they, when they first moved in. It's just a picture, though. It's a picture of the, let's say, the Grand Coulee Dam. It's, it's not like, uh, it, it's not that, that they liked the picture so much, but that the, that the artist was a professor, let's say, of, of her husband's from a college named Clifford Still. Your friend then asks if, you ever had that picture appraised by any chance? Oh, no, no. <laughs> well, he recommends that you do it right away because Clifford Still was the founder of the abstract impressionist movement, and his artwork very rarely comes up for auction. In fact, that painting could be worth as much as a half a million dollars. That was essentially the case in one of the episodes of Antiques Roadshow. Think about that. A painting that you might have seen every day of your life, that you really cared nothing about. It was kind of a weird painting as it was. But it's actually incredibly valuable. Sometimes 
something that may seem so common to us can actually be of great worth, such as the case with marriage. Marriage is very common. Every culture on earth has marriage. But at the same time, God says marriage is of great worth. And what we learned last week was that marriage was designed by God for His glory. Last week, we were reminded that when husbands love their wives and wives submit to their husbands, the, what the world is seeing is a dim picture of Christ's relationship with His church. Husbands, God didn't give you your wife to limit your joy or your happiness, but so that in loving and leading her, you would glorify Christ. And wise, God didn't give you your husband to disappoint and frustrate you, but through submitting to and respecting him, that you would glorify Christ. As one author put it, he says, the marriage relationship is transparent to God's purposes on a larger scale. No other relationship within the family so fully mirrors God's purposes in the universe. You know, you may have never known this about marriage. Like that picture hanging on the wall, right? You didn't realize how much value God had invested into marriage, and it was just common to you. But yet it's very valuable to others. God chose to take something so common, something so common as marriage, and he invested it, invested it with great worth. It depicts the love of Christ for the church. This is God's plan. This is his design. This is his desire for your marriage. And whatever your circumstances may be today, God has given you his spirit to help you and to empower you to live for him and to glorify him in your marriage. Neither you nor your spouse, you're not what you should be. But Christ is ready to work in you and to help you be what he wants you to be. Husbands, all of us, all of us are leading our wives. And many of us are doing a poor job of it. Christ wants to help you to learn how to lead your wife, to love your wife as he leads and loves his church. And wives, some of you are, are, are tearing your husband down through through your criticism, through your lack of respect. You're pulling down your house with your own hands. And Christ, want to, Christ wants to make you the crown of your husband. He wants to help you to submit to him and to respect to him as your God-given head. The path to harmony and to happiness in your home is not through putting your happiness first. This is what the world will tell you, and if you pursue that, your marriage will end up like most marriages in the world that you see today. Rather, like any other area of your walk with Christ, happiness is found in spirit-empowered obedience to God and to His Word. Remember, Christ has, vest, has a vested interest in the success of your marriage. It reflects the glory of his love and of his power. In him is both your hope and your help for joy and for happiness in your home. So Paul chooses in Ephesians chapter 5 to begin with wives. So that's where we'll begin. Are you ready, ladies? He's going to talk to you about your duty in marriage. Your role is vital. No one knows your husband like you do. And you can either build him up or you can tear him down by how you treat him. And that being said, Paul has much more to say to husbands, and rightly so. Right, Husbands, you're responsible for the well-being of your home. And as Paul says here, Christ made you the head. So pray for your wives, man but also pray that you would have a humble, fearful, 
and teachable heart and that God would help you to be the head your wife needs. So this morning, we look at the Christian wife's free and fearless submission. The Christian wife's free and fearless submission. So let's look at our text. We'll be looking at verses 21 to 24 in Ephesians chapter 5. It says, Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But the church is subject to Christ. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Here's how I summarize what I'd like to say to you this morning. The wife who rests in God's sovereign care for her can submit freely, fully, faithfully, and fearlessly to the husband God gave her. The wife who rests in, the, in God's sovereign care for her can submit freely, fully, faithfully, and fearlessly to the husband God gave her. Ladies, reigning over your life is a sovereign God who loves you, who cares about you. And that is where you have to begin. And this is, is where you must remain because your husband will make mistakes. But God never does. He's the one who brought your, you to your husband. And it's he who says to you, it is your duty to me to lovingly submit to him. And so, ladies, because of who your God is, you can first of all submit freely to your husband in response to God's command. Submit freely to your husband in response to God's command. So, wives, he says in verse 22, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. So the first thing to note in verse 22 is, is that the verse actually in the Greek, it doesn't contain any verb. And I know you ladies were like, hold on, the verb's not there. You all were waiting to jump on me for that, weren't you? <laughs> I'm joking. Because you all study it in the Greek, don't you? No, it's not there. There's, there's no verb if you were to look at that in the Greek. It's missing in some manuscripts, right, that, from which the, we have our English translation. Uh, it's included in the majority of manuscripts from, from the earliest times. Why do I say this? Because you're bound to hear it somewhere, somewhere along the way. Did you know that that word is not in there? Did you know subject is not even in that verse? Well, you know what? Even if it's not there, even if, even if Paul didn't actually write the word be subject, the context of the preceding section, section is what? Mutual submission. Submit to one another. Right? That's, that's what leads us into this whole section. The summary verse at the end, in verse 33, it reflects submission to authority. The context of the section between the beginning in verse 22 or 21 and then in verse 33, the context of everything that flows through there is submission to authority, where children are obeying their God-given authority of their parents. And additionally, if we were to look at the parallel passage of Paul's letter to the Colossians, this very same section, it's there. He says it clearly, wives, and the word is there, be subject to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. And so... What we do in the English is we just carry over the verbal idea from verse 21, where Paul says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, and wives, be subject to your husbands, to your own husbands. So the meaning of be subject or submitting, it has to do with the, the subordination of someone in a proper way to someone who is in authority over them. So at the heart of submission is the idea of order. God has established certain 
a certain order in the universe. He's established an order in the home, in the Christian home, in all homes. God has established certain authority or leadership roles. And even though this authority is exercised by people, it's God who, did, who gave this authority and delegated it. So it follows that, that other people are required to conscientiously submit to it. The authority of a husband, as well as that of a parent, as well as that of a boss, right? These are all things that he reflects in this passage. It comes from God. It's delegated authority. God is a God of order. He's the one who has established a husband's leadership role in the family, which means that a wife's submission to her, whole, her own husband is a humble recognition of the divine ordering of society. And Paul is very clear here. He, he's not calling on women to submit to every man. He's calling on wives to submit to their own husbands. Now, what's fitting in a wife's submission to her husband is not fitting in relationship to other men. Paul points to this as an example. He says in verse 15 of chapter 5 of walking wisely with Christ. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And then he uses it to say, wives, submit to your own husbands. This is how you walk wisely with Christ. You don't submit to all men. You submit to your own husbands. That's the ordering of society, the ordering of the home that God has created. So the verb submit, it can, it can be interpreted with a passive or a middle voice. What does that mean? Well, the passive voice could convey the idea that a person submits because he or she is forced to submit. For example, um, like we might be submissive to a dictator. The middle voice, however, see, it could be passive, it could be middle. When you're interpreting it from the Greek, it could be one of these two voices. So with a passive idea, you have to submit. But with the middle voice, it emphasizes the voluntary character of submission. Paul's admission to wives should therefore be understood. It's an appeal. It's an appeal to a free and responsible person. You are free to do as you choose. Submit. Submit to your own husbands. Choose to submit. Ladies, the, the submission that Paul is speaking of here and the kind of submission that honors and glorifies Christ is that of a wife choosing to submit freely to her husband. She's not imposed upon to do it. She chooses to do it. So this is not the submission of one whose will has been broken or the forced submission by one who has been enslaved. This isn't even the submission ultimately, ultimately of a wife to her husband just because he's a good man. See, the, some of you are tempted sometimes to think, oh, I bet, I bet it's easy for her to submit to him because he's a good guy. See, I, I, don't, I don't get it that easy. My husband's a jerk. You might be tempted to think, well, it's easy for Rosita to submit to Nick. He's the pastor. He's a good guy. My wife is too kind to tell you how difficult it must be to submit to me at times. But that's a truth. She chooses to submit. See, there's what's in view here, first and foremost, is the willing and loving response of a Christian woman to her Lord. There's no tyranny here. There's no inferiority here. This is the acknowledgement that wives and husbands have equal dignity because each have been made in God's image, but they have different God-ordained roles. Paul uses the very same verb in Christ's submission to the authority of the Father in 1 Corinthians 15:28. It says, when all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. So there is no inherent shame or inferiority when a wife chooses 
to submit to her husband, but instead there is a glorious recognition of her husband as the leader God appointed for her. In the same way, the church freely submits to Christ. So the wife, in response to God's command, freely submits to her husband. This also means that it's not her role in society or her place in a, in a male-dominated culture that, that calls her to submit, nor is it to be understood as separate from her submission to the Lord. No, the Christian wife submits as to the Lord, it says. Her submission to her husband is this willing extension of her submission to Christ. And so, in addition to freely submitting to your husband in response to God's command, you also submit fully to your husband in recognition of God's design. Submit fully to your husband in recognition to God's design. Paul now brings forward the reason for the wife's submission to her husband. In verse 23, the first part, he says, for the husband is the head of the wife. Now, Paul draws this reason not, not from culture, but from creation. Before any culture had yet been established. You'll, you'll, if you read certain books, you go to certain classes at college, they'll tell you the reason that you're submitting is because culture demands that you submit. Our male-dominated culture demands that you submit. You need to break free of those shackles, ladies. God's command came before any culture ever existed. Because the husband is the head of the wife. So that makes this argument all the more profound here. Paul doesn't elaborate here on the origin of his argument. To that, we need to turn to a different verse, and you're welcome to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 speaks of it. In 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 3, he says, But I, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. For a man, in verse 7 now, ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and the glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man, for man does not originate from woman. See where he's going? He's going back to creation. But woman originates from man. For indeed, man is not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. He needs a suitable helper. None of the animals will do. So he makes woman. We looked at this last week. Verse 12, for as the woman originates from the man, he took, he took her from the man's side and created woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Thank you. Turn also to 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, in verse 11, it says, A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. That's like a sin in our culture to say something like that. That is a secular sin right there today to say that. You should be banished from our society. You need to grow a beard this long and be banished to say something like that. But he tells us why. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. This goes back before society. This is the origin of society. See, in these verses, he goes back to Genesis 2 to emphasize the order, the mode, the purpose of the creation of Eve. And since it's, it's mainly on these facts of creation that, that Paul bases his case for the husband's headship, his argument, it has permanent, universal validity. They argue that we're going against a woman's worth to say that a woman should submit to her husband. We argue you're going against God's created order. And in so doing, you are sabotaging your own well-being. You can't dismiss this as cultural application of a principle. It is the founding principle itself before any culture existed. 
all cultures reflect to greater or lesser degrees this foundational principle. They may seek to modify it, they may seek to distort it, even reject it altogether as God's design, but they cannot destroy it. It's in our DNA. Now, even without any reference to Genesis, Paul uh, could not have been any clearer in stating that God designed marriage and the roles in marriage. And to help see how Paul does this in this verse, uh, there's a, a brief grammar lesson that we have to go through. Um, it's a lesson, by the way, that I gleaned from Douglas Wilson's book, Reforming Marriage. In Scripture, there are two important distinctions to keep in mind. Right? There, there are indicatives and there are imperatives. You're like, whoa, whoa, I left school a long time ago. Don't, don't throw those words at me. Indicatives and imperative. What is an indicative? Statement of fact. Right? There's no, there's no ought in a statement of fact. There just is, right? The sky is blue. Sacramento is hot in the summer. The sock is stinky. Right? These are statements of fact. An imperative, our other word, those are indicatives. Imperatives, they are commands that tell us what to do. Sit down. Pull over. Right? Get out of here. Right? These are all commands. And so if I say the glass is on the table, I'm stating a fact. I'm stating an indicative. But if I say, put the glass on the table, then this is a command. This is an imperative. Okay? So we have to keep these two clear in our minds what they are. Because in the Bible, indicatives need to remain indicatives. And imperatives need to remain imperatives. Now the gospel, the gospel is an indicative. It tells us what Jesus has done on the cross to save sinners. <clears throat> And this is how it must be faithfully proclaimed. There's a huge problem when the message of the gospel is presented as an imperative because then it becomes something that sinners must do to earn salvation. <clears throat> and that's not the gospel. So the same confusion has to be avoided in our effort to understand the Bible's teaching on headship and authority in marriage. Now, what does the Bible say about the husband? The husband is the head of the wife. He most assuredly, he does not say the husband ought to be the head of the wife. God states a fact. The husband is the head of his wife. God is telling us here what the marriage relationship between a husband and a wife is. God is the author of marriage, and his design includes the headship of a husband over a wife. In other words, without his headship. There is no marriage. Man can attempt to redefine. He can attempt to reconfigure it. But that doesn't change the fact of what God says marriage is. And you only need to look a few verses ahead to see that God has some very important imperatives that flow from this significant indicative. Because of what the husband is, here is what you need to do. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. But nowhere is the husband commanded to be the head of his wife. And this is because you already are the head of your wife. It's a statement of fact. By the very nature of marriage, according to God's design, you are the head. There's a number of implications from this indicative for us husbands that we're going to look at, but not at this time. For now, it's enough that we see that God presents the husband's leadership, his headship, as first of all, a fact. And secondly, it's the basis for the wife's submission. This is why. Because Christ has given you a head, your husband. So submit to your God-given head. Because this is so clearly God's design for marriage wives, you, you can submit fully to your husband. 
Ladies, to, to carry out this duty and to, and to carry it out with love, with joy, you're going to need to dwell richly on God's Word. Because that is what the Spirit uses to empower you to live for Him in any and all circumstances. Right, John Bunyan, <clears throat> a Puritan of old, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress, one of the best-selling Christian books of all time. He wrote another book called Christian Behavior. And he says this, The whole Bible was given for this very end that you should both believe this doctrine and live in the comfort and sweetness of it. How can you live, ladies? How can you live in the sweetness and, com and comfort of doctrines if you don't know what they are? You need not just to read his word, ladies. You need to study his word. You need to study the doctrines the word contains so that you can live in the joy of these doctrines. Your calling to be a good wife, it's just simply an extension of your first calling, which is to be a good Christian. Ladies, you need to cultivate a taste for the Word of God, as well as for books that will build up your faith in Christ, not just books that will take you to fantasy land. An immature Christian woman makes for an immature Christian wife. So you need to discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness in your walk and in your marriage. How? You need to be in the Word, reading it and studying it. We also need to make sure that there's enough ladies that are serving in the nursery and in the children's ministry. Why? Because there needs to be, if we had an, all our ladies serving, there would be plenty of rotation. And, and those ladies could all be in here on a, on a rotating basis. And no one would feel like, man, I haven't been in service in four weeks. So that's, a, that's one indirect application from what we're talking about. I want to make sure that, that no one's getting stuck back there because they need to be out here just as much as I do. All of this will help you to be a woman of the word who walks with the power, in the power of his spirit in your home. Now, God also wants to help you to submit faithfully to your husband in reflection of God's care. Submit faithfully to your husband in reflection of God's care. <clears throat> so after relating the headship of the husband over the wife to the headship of Christ over the church, Paul then adds this about Christ. He himself being the savior of the body. So since the wife is, is never described as the husband's body, as the church is said to be Christ's body, the wife is never described that way. And since the 24 times that the term savior is used in the New Testament, it only refers to Jesus or to God, then we can conclude that, that Paul only has Christ in view here, not the husband. The husband's role is not to save or to rescue his wife from doom in the same way that Christ rescues his church. So why then does Paul make this reference to Christ being the Savior of the church, which is his body? Well, Paul here, he, he's been urging wives to be submissive to their husbands. And the primary reason for this, it rests on the headship of the husband, which is parallel to Christ's headship or rule over the church. So Paul here is, is pointing to husbands and to wives. He's pointing them to this person who is the head of the church, and he adds, the one who is head is also the one who has saved you from spiritual doom by his own deaths, his own death, wives, you can trust him. Wives, submit to the husband that I, your Savior, gave you. So even though the reference isn't direct right here about husbands being a Savior in some way, I, I don't think it's necessarily out of bounds to say that, that Paul inserts this here to remind wives that God intends husbands to protect their wives, much in the same manner as Paul says in, in chapter 5 and verse 29 where he says, no one, can, no one has ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ also does the church because we're members of his body. He says that to husbands. 
And so there's no reason to think that he might not be referencing that role of a husband. A husband should protect his wife in times of danger, both physically and spiritually. And we can look back to the very first marriage and say that our need of a Savior today is a consequence of Adam, the first husband. He didn't protect his wife from the serpent's lie. But where Adam failed, Christ was faithful. He loved his bride. He gave himself up for her in order not only to protect her, but to save her. So ladies, Paul is is going to point your husband to the pattern of Christ for the way that he's to protect and to love and to serve you. And there's going to be times when your husband loves you like Christ. And there's going to be times when he fails you like Adam. But here is what you need to know, ladies. Christ, your Savior, your faithful husband, he will never fail you. And it is with his care for you in mind that you can submit faithfully to your husband. And by faithfully, I mean with full assurance and with full trust. Who are you to trust in? Are you to trust in your husband? Well, yes, and and hopefully he's worthy of your trust. Well, I would say that he's, he's likely as trustworthy as you are. Let's put it that way which is to say that he has a record of faithfulness. It's just not a spotless one. Your record isn't spotless, is it, ladies? So that, that's certainly one reason why you can submit faithfully. But it's not the ultimate reason. Right? The reason why you can submit faithfully, trustingly to your husband, is because God is the one faithfully caring for you. Your trust is in him. And when you trust your husband's leadership and he fails you, it's not outside God's care for you. The best way to see it is this. You're looking at your husband and you're thinking, I need to submit fully to you. And you've failed me in the past. And I think you might be failing me right now. And so when that happens and you're thinking, how can I, how can I do this? How can I submit to you? You need to push God your husband aside and see who's behind him. And that's Christ, the one who gave you your husband. Remember the sovereign God? The one who causes all things to work for your good? Set your husband aside. You're submitting to Christ when you submit to your husband. And lastly, and, and, and very closely related to this, submit fearlessly to your husband, resting in God's sovereignty. Submit fearlessly to your husband, resting in God's sovereignty. Verse 24 says, But as the, as the church is subject to Christ, so also the, wife, the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Paul uses the, the same verb to refer to the church's submission that he uses for the wives. It's in the middle voice. It's again, it's, it's, it's stressing the willing character of the church's submission to Christ. Paul is saying, as the church is willingly subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to willingly be subject to their own husbands. And to this, Paul adds, in everything. You're like, it was already hard enough when you said, submit to my husband. And then you had to go and add, in everything? And then your verse becomes, what is impossible with man is possible with God. That's right. You're absolutely right. Let's begin by what this doesn't mean, though. Paul is not saying that a wife should submit to her husband in anything that is contrary to the commands of God. We are to obey God more than men. In other words, the wife is not to submit to her husband in in anything sinful, which includes abuse. What Paul is saying is that wives are to willingly subject themselves to their husbands in every area of life. No part of your life should be outside of your relationship to your husband and outside of subjecting it to him. Just as the church submits to Christ in everything, in the same way and in every sphere, wives are to submit to their husbands. 
we also need to take in everything in the flow of the argument that, that Paul has been making in this book of Ephesians. By God's design, husband and wife are one flesh. That goes back to the beginning, back to Genesis. And God's intention is that they should function together under one head and as two autonomous, not as two autonomous individuals who are living in the same house. No, this causes the relationship to function in light of what it is. Two separate people who have been brought together in Christ that function as one. And this reflects what God is doing in all the universe. Bringing all things in subjection under His Son. All things into unity under Christ. So what God is doing in the universe... He's doing also in your home. He's beginning there. How is this possible, ladies? Perhaps you're finding it difficult to do this in your marriage. You might even be secretly miserable because of the shortcomings that you see in your husband. You, you think to yourself, I just, I just want my husband to be an obedient Christian who will exercise godly loving headship and you tell yourself oh shoot it would be easier to submit to him if he would just start exercising some spiritual leadership in our home ladies god has commanded you to respect and honor and submit to your husband with no qualifications he doesn't say wives be subject to your husbands if there's no if there God is seeking to bless your marriage and he will do so as you obey him. Perhaps you need to repent this morning. Repent from the discontentment with your husband and the unsubmissive heart that you have because sin never leads to blessing and perhaps this is the very sin that has been robbing you of your joy and not just in your marriage, but in your, your walk altogether. Your discontentment has blinded you to the many good qualities of your husband. In fact, it, it's far easier for you to think of his shortcomings than his strengths. And if this is true of you, I urge you to take the time to examine your life, your heart. Look at where you know you have resisted your husband and surrendered. This is how you will leave behind your discontentment. This is how you will know happiness and joy again in your walk. The blessings that results from just simple obedience to God's commands is wonderful. And it's, and it's wonderful regardless of any changes in your husband. Submitting to your husband in many ways, it, it may be a challenge, but Paul's very clear. You need to submit in everything. In all areas, your schedule, your hobbies, your management of your home, your care for the children, your ministry, your friendships, your pursuits, your work, your body. And that sounds scary. Won't I lose my identity? How is this possible? Ladies, the only way that you can do this, the only way that you can submit fearlessly to your husband is by learning to rest in God's sovereignty. Peter gives us a strong picture of womanhood that, that reveals how hope in God undergirds and supports submission. Trust in God is what makes fearless submission both possible and beautiful. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse 1 begins this way. 1 Peter 3, verse 1. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands. And then jump to verse 5. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. See, a Christian woman does not put her hope in her husband, nor does she put her hope in getting a husband. Her hope is not in how she looks. It's not in her intelligence. She puts her hope in God. 
Each day ha has enough trouble, troubles of its own, and there are plenty of challenge, challenges that cause doubt and fear about the future. This woman, though, she looks away from them. She focuses her attention on the sovereign power and love of God who is putting all things in heaven and in earth in submission to his Son. And this is a woman who knows her Bible. Her theology of God's sovereignty, she knows God's promises that he will be with her to help her, to assure her, to strengthen and empower her, to comfort her, provide for her, guide her no matter what. She is unshakable and grounded in the sovereign goodness of her God. See, this solid hope in God is what leads to fearlessness. Verse 5 says that the holy women of, holy women of old hoped in God. And, and then verse 6 says, Sarah, Abraham's wife, she's an example of this. And he says, in verse 6, you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. You don't fear what the future may bring because your hope in God has driven out your fear. And I'm not saying you never feel anxious. I'm not saying you never feel fearful. I'm saying such women don't surrender to their fear, but instead they fight it with their hope in the promise of God. They know suffering will happen if they follow Christ, but they believe what God says in verse 14 of chapter 3 in 1 Peter, even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation. Do not be troubled. And this is what a Christian woman does. She submits to her, her husband in everything because her trust and her hope is ultimately in her sovereign God. Does she submit when her unsaved husband wants to, tell, wants to sell their home, buy a motor home, spend all their time traveling, and she won't be able to go to church or have relationships with her sisters in Christ anymore? Yes, she puts her hope in God and she submits without fear. We knew a woman who had to do this. She did it joyfully. Does she continue to submit when her husband's poor decisions cost them their home? Yes, yeah, she puts her hope in God. She submits without fear. Does she submit when her husband asks her to, help, to work, to help make ends meet? Does she submit when his views on disciplining children differ, differ from hers? Does she submit when his hobbies require her to do extra work? Does she submit when she, uh, when she thinks that she has the better idea? Yes, in all these. And hopefully there's, hopefully there's discussion. Hopefully there's appeal within all of this. But in the end, if things go different than what she would prefer, she puts her hope in God and she submits without fear. Submission does not mean that you agree with everything your husband says. My wife doesn't agree with everything I say. I usually come around to see things rightly, eventually. It can't mean this when Peter begins this section by encouraging wives to submit to their husbands who might not even be saved. So it doesn't mean that you have to agree with your husband in everything. It means that you can submit to a husband's who, husband whose view of the world is different from yours while still submitting to God. And so submission, it can't mean to agree with all that your husband thinks. Submission doesn't mean that you never seek to change your husband. Let me say that again. Submission doesn't mean, ladies, that you don't seek to change your husband. In fact, Peter calls you to submit in the hope that change will come about. Do you see that in Peter? You're submitting in the hope that your submitting will lead to a change in your husband. He says it in verse 1. He tells wives, be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. And so when you're sitting there and you're thinking, but he's wrong, he's wrong. 
remember what Peter says. Submit. Submit in hope. Submit without a word. Because God can change disobedient husbands through your submission to them. You're willing, you're free, you're full, you're faithful, fearless submission because you're submitting to God first. Women who don't believe the Bible think that they have to take their husbands the way he is and not try to change them. Women who believe the Bible come to see that submission is sometimes the very strategy for changing them. And this is because a wife's submission is beautiful and it's attractive and it can't be ignored even by a disobedient husband. Ladies, God has designed your relationship with your husband to represent the relationship between Christ and his church. And this is why God made marriage. And this is also why the roles of headship and submission, they are so important in marriage. God is not only for you in your marriage, but God is over your marriage. Every aspect of it. And so look to your God. Hope in your God. Trust in His promises. Look to the future without fear. The wife who rests in God's sovereign care for her can submit freely, fully, faithfully, and fearlessly to the husband that God gave you. Amen? Lord, for this we need faith. Wives, ladies who will be wives, ladies who hope to be wives again, need faith to carry out your commands. And I pray that you will supply it in great abundance as they turn to your word, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Strengthen these ladies in their faith through your word. May they order their days to begin with reminding them of your promises, dwelling in your word richly. May you help them through your Spirit's work in them to take your word for what it is, truth that can be from a God whom they can trust. Help them when it is difficult to set aside the husband who they find they don't want to submit to or respect to set him aside and see their Savior, their Lord, who they are bowing down to, and to give that which he does not deserve and has not earned, but to give it to their husband, who, to, their, to their faithful husband, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to submit fearlessly to their earthly husband. Oh, help our ladies to do this, because it will bring about change in us, us husbands. And we need that change. We need that help. We commit all this to you, Lord, in the name of your Son. Amen. Let's stand. God over all, giver of life and health and breath, I want to sing of your love. Came as a man, humble you died the sinner's death. I want to sing.